yeah, let me let me welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today, everyone. Um, we uh, it's hard to believe that last week's webinar we had snow in the forecast. So thank you for joining us today on a above 80 degrees day. Uh, in a moment, Chasco director and Crown Family School professor Harold Pollack will offer brief opening remarks and introduce today's presenter, Rand Corporation economist Stephanie Renan. If you have any questions, please type them in the Zoom Q&A pane or the chat function. Uh, we will try to address clarifying questions as the presentation uh, progresses. Uh, otherwise, we'll have a more robust discussion towards the end after the presentation. A recording of today's webinar will be available on the CHAS website at chas.uchicago.edu, as well as on the CHAS YouTube channel, which can be found by searching for the Center for Health Administration Studies. And now, uh, Professor Pollack will introduce today's presenter. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, it is, uh, it's, th this is a topic very dear to my heart. Uh, uh, today, we're, we're going to hear from Stephanie Renan. Now, I should say that Stephanie's mom is not on the Zoom, so I'm going to be brief in the introduction. Um, but I'll say a couple of things. One of the most basic is, I think the COVID pandemic has really reminded all of us of the incredible challenge of caregiving for both people living with disabilities and for their loved ones, uh, and uh, and the complexity of, of social assistance programs that interact with people with disabilities and people caring for people with disabilities is, is just so profound, and there's just nothing that's more important in American social policy. Uh, I should say that uh, Dr. Renan is a full economist at the Rand Party School of uh, Public Policy, and as published a number of uh, really excellent analyses about that sort of policy disability interface and really combined solid economic analysis with uh, actual knowledge of the granularity of these complex public policies. And I think that's just, that's just incredibly important. And um, uh, so you know, we're gonna hear today about how SSI interacts with family caregiving. Uh, and, uh, and, and Stephanie, why don't you take it away? Great. Thanks so much, Harold, for that introduction. Thanks to everyone for being here today. Um, yeah, I, I'm an economist at the Rand Corporation, um, and I'm also your neighbor. I'm based in Hyde Park, so I'm happy to, you know, meet you distantly outside for coffee, especially if we continue to have nice weather like we have today. Apologies, I meant to mention that. Apologies. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, as Harold said, today I'm going to be sharing some work looking at that interaction exactly between, you know, the program supports we have for individuals with disabilities and how they affect the caregiving challenges, um, particularly that families of children with special health care needs face. Um, this is a collaboration with some of my colleagues at RAND, Andy Dick and Lynn Carolee. Um, and I want to be sure to acknowledge our funder, the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities. This is ongoing work under a grant we have from them. And so, you know, we're really looking forward to having discussion today and, you know, welcome your feedback on our work in progress. Um, so I just want to begin by sharing a definition to get a sense of, you know, kind of the, who we're talking about when we're talking about children with special health care needs. Um, this is a, a definition. It's used quite commonly developed by the Maternal Child Health Bureau which defines children with special health care needs as being at in increased risk of a chronic physical, developmental, behavioral, or emotional condition and require health services beyond that required by children generally. Um, so in, in a lot of ways, it's really a quite broad definition, but um, there are some common themes for the families of these children, namely that they, off, they have to take on additional roles as caregivers and even in situations when the care is provided outside of the home, um, have a, a substantial role to play in terms of care coordination, um, you know, accessing programs, applying for programs, communicating between different providers, all of that sort of thing. And so it's not a surprise that all the challenges and, you know, difficulties in coordinating and providing care lead to increased stress, financial risk, and health consequences for the family members above and beyond the health challenges faced by the, the children in these families. Um, also, not surprisingly, unfortunately, the difficulties are largest for the most disadvantaged families, um, which have led to disparities in caregiving burden along lines of income and race and ethnicity. So as Harold alluded to, the, pand the pandemic has only further exacerbated these challenges. Um, this figure comes from a study out of the University of Oregon. They're doing a series of pulse surveys of families of young children under age five 
and occasionally they focus their pulse surveys on households of individuals with disabilities. And so as you can see, there's higher rates of caregiver anxiety, caregiver depression, and caregiver stress among those households of children with disabilities compared to households of um, young children who do not have impairments. There's also higher rates of child behavior problems and child anxiety in these families as well. So this is a really big challenge. Um, this is the, you know, the, the issue that's motivated our work in this grant and the Supplemental Security Income or SSI program could potentially offer at least a partial solution to mitigate some of these costs and challenges. Um, so just, you know, for those who may not be super familiar with the program, SSI provides both cash and facilitates access to Medicaid for low income families of children with special needs. Um, I say low income because the program is means tested and the benefits reduce as income increases in the household, typically completely phasing out around when families reach about the 200% of the federal poverty level. Um, there's some variation depending on household composition about exactly when that benefit phases out, but that's about the range you should be thinking about. Um, so the Social Security Administration has its own definition of kind of the types of individuals who meet this criteria. For children, um, they must have a medically determined physical or mental impairment, which re results in severe limitations that last, you know, for a substantial period of time or, or result in death. Um, in order to document or kind of demonstrate that, that an individual meets these criteria, the application process requires documentation, both from medical providers as well as in the case of children, oftentimes from schools, if the children you know, are in special education, they need to provide documentation from their IEP or other information from teachers and social workers in the school. Um, so that's, you know, the, the, we have this policy in place, it's been in place for a while that potentially addresses some of these concerns, but to date, there really hasn't been a lot of um, research focusing on this the impacts of this program on the on the family of the individual who qualifies. And so that those that's the focus of our research questions in this work. Um, so first we want to study, we're, we're first asking to what extent does SSI reduce caregiver burden of families for children with special needs? Um, we define caregiver burden as self-reported mental health needs of the family, as well as financial strain in the household. And then secondly, we want to ask to what extent does SSI mitigate disparities in caregiver burden for those lower income families and families of color who have children with special health care needs. So now I'm going to just share a few more kind of statistics on SSI to kind of get in your head what the population looks like who's served by this program. So SSI serves low income elderly individuals, working age adults with disabilities, as well as children. Of course, that, you know, the children are the focus of this particular study. Um, so that's, you know, this, this dark line shown at the bottom, the solid line. This chart shows the, the you know, SSI beneficiaries in those, eight, in those age groups indicated as a percentage of the entire population in that age group. Um, and of course, when you look at that bottom line for children, you see this dramatic increase during the 1990s. Um, that original increase was driven by some large changes in eligibility criteria for the program, as well as some interactions um, with welfare reform and some caseload shifting from, from individuals who were previously on AFDC. Um, since 2000, however, the policy parameters of the program have remained pretty much constant, and yet there's continued to be fairly steady growth in the share of children who've participated in the program. Um, I'll get into this a little bit more later, but the majority of that growth has been among children who have behavioral health or mental health conditions, uh, things like ADHD, um, autism, um, conditions like that. Since, you know, this graph ends in, in 2014, since that point, um, population has kind of leveled off. It's been about kind of at the same share of the, of the age group population. In 2019, that's the most recent numbers we have to date. There were about 1.2 chil million children in the program and annual expenditures were around $10, um, $10 billion. So this just provides some statistics on the population of children who were receiving SSI in 2019. So about 43% were adolescents, two thirds were boys, two thirds were in single parent households, about 58, 59% of children were in households where they received the maximum SSI payment. So in other words, that phase in or phase out, excuse me, hasn't kicked in. So they're in, you know, much lower income families than that kind of upper threshold that I mentioned earlier. And as I mentioned before, nearly 75% of children had a primary diagnosis in their documentation as a mental or behavioral health condition. So that's really the, the, the bulk of the caseload um, at this point among children on the program. 
So, you know, I mentioned there's been this long period of steady growth, but again, returning to the pandemic, things have shifted dramatically. So this chart shows kind of the month on month change in application volume. It's been normalized to January in each year. And it's showing application volume in the three years prior to the pandemic, as well as, you know, obviously that dark line is for 2020. So the three years prior, you can see there's some seasonality, but application volume kind of tends to track in a similar pattern. And in 2020, by contrast, like all things 2020, it's different. Um, there's been a significant decline in applications. So even though this has been a, a period of increased need, when you may see a lot of families with lower incomes and higher caregiving burden for a variety of reasons, um, there's been you know, limits in, in the ability of families to access this program during, during the pandemic. So why? Um, the biggest reason is that field offices for Social Security Administration closed in March of 2020 and have not yet reopened. Uh, we know from prior work that field office closures reduce applications and awards um, to SSI and SSDI. We also know by contrast that if you reduce some of these barriers to access by facilitating um, applications online, that does increase applications and awards. But that's not an option for SSI for children. Um, those applications still must be done in person or over the phone. So that's by far and away kind of the biggest explanation for that decline that we've seen. But also, you know, as I mentioned, these, these applications require a lot of documentation from individuals in you know, the school environment, as well as from medical providers. And of course, schools have been closed and you know, medical visits have been limited. And so those are also some other reasons why that likely contribute to that decline in applications that we've seen. Um, so our work in this study is actually primarily looking at the period before the pandemic. We're, we're hoping to expand um, in sort of the next phase into looking at some of these pandemic related issues. But, you know, this is obviously really important motivation for the work. It really, so I'd be remiss in not mentioning the pandemic as sort of one of the motiv motivating factors for this study. Um, I just want to share some of the other things that we know about child SSI. So we know that child SSI has been shown to increase household income and also to stabilize household income over time um, for especially for these low income households where other sources of income can be quite volatile. SSI has been shown to reduce food insecurity, uh, to reduce the number of hours that parents work. And the component, there's a component of SSI that targets low birth weight infants in particular, and that has been shown to improve infant development and parenting behaviors. So we have this constellation of evidence that all points in the direction of all these beneficial effects for these households of children with special health care needs. But whether that translates into kind of reduced family caregiver burden is still unknown. It still remains a gap in the literature, and one that we're hoping to address with our work in this study. So also there's a, there's a broader light that fits into what we're doing here, which thinks kind of beyond the direct intended effect of any public program and thinks about kind of other, you know, broader effects of these programs. So for example, the literature on expansions in public health insurance have found that these have, you know, benefits for financial outcomes in households as well as mental health beyond just sort of the, the, the physical health. Um, SSDI has also been shown to have financial benefits for beneficiaries in terms of reduced risk of foreclosure and bankruptcy and reduced risk of mortality. And SSDI and SSI have also been found to have spillover effects in terms of increasing informal caregiving from other family members. So, you know, I mean, maybe you can think about the, the direct kind of intention of SSI as being fairly narrow and in providing income, but, you know, here we're kind of also fitting into this literature of thinking beyond those direct effects to some of the other other potential consequences of, of these programs. Um, so what are we actually doing in this study? So first we're gonna, we're gonna analyze survey data of a representative population of children with special health care needs. We're first gonna present some descriptive evidence on the disparities that I've alluded to in caregiver burden among different um, families of children with special health care needs. Um, and then we're going to exploit a variety of policy features from the SSI program to identify um, ways that SSI could mitigate caregiver burden. So I, I'll get into this a little bit more, but we think there's, there's two main channels that could you know, have effects on caregiver burden. The first, and this is actually the main one that I'm gonna focus on today, is due to the fact that SSI kind of facilitates access to Medicaid and reduces some of those barriers to participation in the program. And then the second is the value of the, the cash benefit provided. Although um, I'm happy to talk about that later, probably won't have time to get to it today. 
Um, so to do that, yeah, our primary data source is the National Survey of Children with Special Health Care Needs. Um, if any of you have kind of thought about child health issues for this population of kids with special health care needs, you're probably familiar with this study. It's been very widely used and cited. Um, there's a series of cross-sectional waves of this survey. Each of them is about 40,000 children with special health care needs. And the survey is designed to be representative both at the national level and at the state level. So this by far and away is one of the, the largest advantages of using this data source. Um, you know, if you recall from that graph I showed you earlier, as a percent of the entire population, children on SSI are only about one to 2% of the entire population. So if you think of any nationally representative survey that's representative of the general population, it's just extremely rare to pull enough of these children into the sample to do kind of robust analysis. So this is, this is one of the main reasons that we've turned to this data source and one of the main reasons so many other people turn to this data source. Um, it also has a lot of really valuable you know, variables that are kind of unique and, and difficult to find in order to address these issues of caregiver burden. So it has the information on these outcomes of interest, which I'll, I'll show you more in a minute. It also has a lot of information about child health conditions, child and family demographics, as well as SSI receipt. Um, and then we're gonna also integrate a variety of information on, on different policy parameters for the programs that we're interested in. So, you know, we're pulling information about Medicaid from Kaiser. We're going to use a variety of sources from the Social Security Administration um, for, for more detail on SSI policies. And in the cash component, we're also integrating some information about TANF and child care subsidies from, from databases at the Urban Institute. Okay, so now I wanna show you some of the kind of trends in demographics that we're seeing or trends in the data that we're seeing um, directly rather than kind of as a SSI population as a whole, like I showed you before. So in each of these graphs, the blue bar is showing the you know, share of the, the population in the survey that receives SSI. And then the gray bar is all other children with special health care needs in the survey. So across both groups, about 40% of the population is, is our girls. Um, but there's, you know, a higher share of individuals who are children of color in the SSI population, about 55% compared to about 40% in the non-SSI population. Also, you know, again, likely driven by the means test, you see there's much higher rate of um, children in households with family income below 200% of the poverty level in that SSI group compared to all other children with special health care needs. Receipt of cash welfare, this is primarily TANF, um, is pretty low in both groups, but again, higher in the SSI group compared to the other group. And then there's a big difference in terms of receipt of public insurance as well, with over 80% of kids on SSI on, you know, this is predominantly Medicaid compared to, you know, less than 40% in, in the other, other children with special health care needs. Um, next, just to get a sense of the, the health conditions, I mentioned this before, um, this shows the top six most common health conditions that are reported by children who receive SSI in our sample. Um, and then the corresponding rates for, you know, all other children with special health care needs that we see in the survey. So about 45% of children, you know, report having ADHD, a little less than 40% of children on SSI report having asthma. Um, similar rates for anxiety, followed by depression, autism, and intellectual disability. So one thing that's kind of buried into this graph is that children on SSI also report many more conditions than other children with special health care needs in the survey. So on average, children on SSI report four conditions compared to only about two among other children with special health care needs. So one of the reasons that so many of these blue bars look higher is also due to the fact that um, they're, they're showing up in multiple multiple bars here. And then finally, um, so these are some of the main outcomes that we're going to be looking at in terms of caregiver burden. And you can see here again, looking at those blue bars, the rates are also much higher among the SSI population compared to other kids with special health care needs. So about 20% of families um, of children on SSI report needing mental health care about 25% of families report having financial problems that are associated with the care of their children. Similar rates for families who report having to cut their work hours, um, although a higher share of families actually report that they stopped working altogether in order to care for their child or due to their child's health. And then, uh, you know, over 50% and nearly 50% of all families are, are providing care for these children at home. 
So what does this mean? What, you know, kind of what are we learning just from these baseline characteristics? So first of all, this is confirming what we kind of suspected that families of children on SSI experience more socioeconomic, socioeconomic disadvantage compared to other children with special health care needs. Um, they also have more severe health conditions. So as I mentioned before, not only did they have higher rates of each of those individual conditions, but they just report more of them. Um, and then, you know, they face higher caregiving burdens or that at least they report higher caregiving burdens in the survey. So what, what do we learn from this? So in a lot of ways, these, these differences are confirming that the targeting of the SSI program is working. You know, that's the way it's intended to focus on these low income families with severe health conditions in their, in their, you know, in their children. Now for the kind of from an empirical perspective, of course, this prevents a real challenge in order to estimate the effect of SSI. I mean, if you just kind of at baseline compared these two groups, it would look like, you know, the outcomes are all worse for the SSI population even though that's likely driven by these differences in their characteristics, their baseline characteristics and their baseline needs and not you know, resulting from the fact that they're receiving SSI. So we're gonna to try to take a variety of approaches in our work to overcome these challenges and, and isolate the effect of SSI or different, different aspects of SSI to overcome this, this empirical challenge. Okay, I'm just a second, I'm gonna write some more. So now I'm going to turn to what we're doing on the, on the side of, of access to Medicaid for this population. So um, I, I alluded before I mentioned that SSI facilitates access to Medicaid and um, the, the details vary by state, but the variety, most states link SSI to Medicaid in one way or another. So on this map here, the darkest blue states automatically enroll all SSI beneficiaries in Medicaid. So the way that the, the Social Security Administration website puts it is that an application to SSI is an application to Medicaid. Um, in the middle kind of blue, middle blue bars um, or middle blue states, the SSI beneficiaries are automatically eligible for Medicaid, but they have to go through some additional paperwork to actually enroll. So they still have to kind of separately go to the Medicaid office to enroll. And then finally, in the lightest blue states, SSI eligibility or participation doesn't grant either eligibility or enrollment in Medicaid. So typically these, these individuals still have to meet whatever the typical state criteria are for Medicaid in order to qualify. So it's worth noting though that again, remember this is quite a low income population. So in practice, even though there are additional requirements in those light blue states, the vast majority of individuals um, and particularly children on SSI are likely going to be income eligible for Medicaid as well. Given that the, the income limits for, for children on Medicaid are, are higher that you know, most of them are kind of meeting those criteria one way or another. Um, so the main thing that we're interested in here is this, this automatic enrollment. So kind of separating the eligibility question from the enrollment question. So this is just showing that chart in a different way, you know, kind of, again, the automatic enrollment states, there's 34 of them plus the District of Columbia, um, and they grant both eligibility and enrollment. Categorical eligibility states are also sometimes called criteria states, only grant eligibility. And then finally, the last group, you know, don't have any benefits in terms of eligibility or enrollment. Stephanie, can, can I ask you a clarification question? Yeah. So if someone qualifies for Medicaid through the SSI route, and someone else qualifies for Medicaid because they're, even though they, even though they're on SSI, they qualified for Medicaid because their family's low income. Yeah. Is there a difference in the services that those two individuals would be able to get, say in human, home and community-based services, something like that, because they came in different routes? Yeah, it's a good question. I think most of the time, no, but of course, Medicaid varies a lot by state. So um, I, I've, in some other work, I've been doing some work in New York State's program where they were kind of expanding HCBS services, home community-based services for this population of kids with special health care needs. So I think it, maybe it's not a very satisfying answer, but in general, you can think of it as the same benefit package, although there's likely some states where there's, there's differences. Um, I know New York State in particular is one where they've changed. Thank you. Yep. Um, so, okay, so what do we just kind of, that's, that's the, this is the variation that we're going to be exploring, but what does this mean in terms of how, do, how are we linking this to thinking about caregiving burden? 
So first of all, we, we all know that administrative burden is, is real and limits access to a lot of these programs, including Medicaid. So whether that's through lack of knowledge of the program, confusion and you know, accessing the program, concerns about revealing immigration status, there's a whole lot of reasons that these administrative burdens are preventing eligible individuals from accessing these programs. Um, secondly, we know from automatic enrollment in other settings that it, it has positive Im impacts in terms of increasing Medicaid enrollment. So there's some states, I think around 14 or 15, that have what's called express lane eligibility, where they link Medicaid to other programs like SNAP or TANF. Um, and that has been shown to increase Medicaid enrollment among the general population of children in those states. There's also work that has kind of explored this variation in the population of adults receiving SSI and also found significant increases in Medicaid enrollment. Secondly, thinking about these families um, and their needs, Medicaid is a really salient consideration for a lot of these individuals seeking SSI. So if they're not already on Medicaid, their counterfactual or alternative insurance um, could be no insurance at all or likely some kind of limited private insurance plan. Um, and Medicaid is the largest payer for behavioral health care in the state, or sorry, in the, in the country. And in particular, a lot of those behavioral health needs are, are what these families are seeking. Um, so we have anecdotal, we, you know, just have heard a lot of anecdotal evidence that that's one thing that families are kind of hoping for when they're seeking SSI. Um, also, this, this LeVere study I mentioned explores prior expansions in, in Medicaid eligibility for children and you know, exploits that variation to see what happens to the inflow of individuals into SSI and finds that when you expand eligibility for Medicaid, it actually reduces the flow of individuals into SSI. This is kind of outside of the automatic enrollment question, but again, is, is evidence that this is one of the reasons, this is one of the things that these families are seeking when they're, they're um, you know, kind of applying for SSI. So, you know, in, what does this mean for their caregiving? Well, it could mean a couple of things. First of all, they could be getting better quality care, you know, in terms of things like home and community-based services or behavioral health. And also the burden itself of, of accessing these programs is gonna be reduced if there's automatic enrollment. And that it kind of in and of itself could be another way that caregiving burden is reduced. So we're gonna use a difference in differences strategy to identify the effects of automatic enrollment. Um, so first we're going we're gonna to look at two sets of outcomes. So first we're going to explore the margin of insurance coverage directly. And then we're going to look at these caregiving outcomes that I mentioned before. Um, and so what we're going to do exactly is we're going to compare in, children on SSI in automatic enrollment states with children on SSI in other states. Um, and we're gonna, you know, of course there could be some baseline differences in the characteristics of children across states due to the po population differences. There also could be concerns that different state policies are affecting these children differently across other states. So we're gonna use the other children with special healthcare needs in our data as a control group. Um, in order to do that, the main assumption is that whatever baseline differences we're seeing in terms of population characteristics or the effects of state policies, in the SSI population is going to be a similar effect in these other children with special health care needs. So they can effectively absorb those differences and allow us to isolate the effect of this automatic enrollment policy. So I just next want to show a few slides that are testing out that assumption. So in, in each of these slides, the blue bars are going to show the SSI population. So that light blue bar is the um, automatic enrollment population and the dark blue bar is the, the children on SSI in other states that don't have automatic enrollment. And then the light gray, the gray bars are for the other children with special health care needs. Um, I guess the first takeaway is that a lot of these trends and in, in characteristics look quite similar between the automatic enrollment and non-automatic enrollment states, right? Um, but secondly, in cases where you do see some difference, like in the case of, you know, the share of the population that's not white, you see a much lower share, you know, in these non-automatic enrollment states, but that's true both for the SSI group and the other children with special health care needs. So that's kind of, that's, that's supporting our assumption that these other children are going to do an effective, you know, good job at kind of absorbing those baseline differences. Um, this chart is, is a similar test, but looking at health conditions rather than some of the other demographics. And again, we're seeing pretty similar patterns. You know, of course, there's a big level difference, but we're interested in this difference, making sure that these things look similar between the automatic enrollment and non-automatic enrollment groups um, within each subgroup of the population. Okay, so next I'm going to 
I'm going to show a series of um, charts that are essentially looking, plotting the coefficients from that difference in differences regression I showed before um, for the overall sample, as well as where we've stratified by income level and race and ethnicity. So first, this first chart is showing um, a dependent variable, the, the dependent variable in these regressions is an indicator for whether or not the child is, does not have any insurance at all or is uninsured. And what you can see is that automatic enrollment is reducing on insurance by about two to three percentage points. We're seeing this in the overall population and we're also seeing it in the lowest income population and in the population of children of color. So again, thinking from a disparities perspective, these are the groups that we're kind of most concerned about as having these, these differential consequences of caregiving burden. And they're the ones also where we're seeing these, these effects in terms of reducing uninsurance associated with automatic enrollment. Um, I'll also say, so just like for reference, the baseline uninsurance rate in this population in our data is about three to four percentage points. So these are quite large effects relative to the share of children who are uninsured. Um, so next we look at some other, other measures of insurance. So one limitation of the data is that it doesn't actually do a great job of isolating Medicaid in all states. Um, so it, it isolates Medicaid specifically in 29 states um, where the Medicaid and SCHIP programs have different names. But um, in other states, they kind of just gl glump everything together as public insurance. So as, as our first pass, we look at just indicators for public insurance. And then there's this category of a combination of public and private insurance, which is what I'm showing here. And then private only and the uninsured that I showed you before. So what we're seeing here is that there's actually increases in the, in the rate of children who are covered by a combination of public and private insurance. Um, most, you know, this, this non-white coefficient is quite high, but most of these are around four to six percentage points. And again, if you look at the populations where we're seeing these positive and significant effects, it's, it's occurring in this population with the lowest incomes and in children of color. So this is suggesting that, you know, not only is there effects in terms of providing coverage to children who didn't have it before, but there could also be shifts of kind of expanding the public component of coverage to children who had other types of, of coverage kind of at baseline before enrolling in SSI. And finally, we do look for those 29 states where we're able to identify Medicaid to see if we see something similar. Um, we're seeing positive coefficients in the same populations where you know you have the low income and children of color. They're not statistically significant. We think likely due to some power issues with this, this limited sample that we have to work with um, due to those challenges in the data. So we also conduct a, a series of sensitivity analyses. So um, this is showing that these numbers here are showing the, the coefficients from the regression where we're looking at uninsurance, but you know, we see a similar pattern across others as well. Um, so first we add in additional controls for other med Medicaid eligibility criteria in the state. Um, we do some cuts on the poverty level. Those higher income individuals who are in the sample really shouldn't be doing anything for our estimates and they're not. Um, I mentioned there's this series of states where there's a combination, you know, the, the 209B states are the states where individuals didn't get eligibility or enrollment when they are enrolled in SSI. So um, we're really most interested in kind of the effects of enrollment conditional on eligibility. So just as a, a check, sensitivity check, we drop those additional households and don't see that there's any effect. Um, and then finally, there's a couple different ways that SSI is measured in the data. There's two variables that you can use to define SSI. So we just test the other one to make sure that our results are not sensitive to that one definition. And again, we're finding pretty consistent results throughout. Okay, so now let's next turn to what we see in terms of our caregiving burden outcomes. So this is again, the same regression that I was showing before, just with, with our you know, kind of dependent variables being different measures of, of care. Um, so here, this is whether or not the family uses home care at all. And again, we can see that there's a reduction in home care in the overall population, as well as in this lowest income population of households below 100% of the poverty level. Um, these effects, I will say, you know, this is about three to four percentage points, but it's again, quite, this is on relative to the entire population, about 50% of, of families are using home care. Um, but if you think about it relative to those changes in insurance that we saw that again, they're, they're fairly large effects. 
Um, this next, we look at whether families um, have any changes in the, their work activity. So whether they reduce their work in order to provide care. And here we're seeing that you know auto enrollment is significantly reducing this in, you know, in the overall population, as well as in these lowest income populations and among children of color. Um, we're seeing similar patterns, not, not all of the results are statistically significant, but again, seeing similar patterns in terms of coefficients for some other outcomes. So I just wanted to share a few of those. Um, so next, we're, what we look at here is whether the family reports that the care caused financial problems, and we're seeing you know, that there's a reduction in families reporting care, um, that the care caused financial problems. And finally, whether or not the family needs mental health care, we're seeing some marginally statistically significant results in this lowest income population, um, although the other results are fairly noisy there. So, so what do we think this one, this one arm means? So takeaways are kind of, first of all, remember this is a pretty low income population. So despite the, despite the fact that most of these children will likely be eligible for Medicaid, um, on the basis of income alone, automatic enrollment is still having effects on their insurance coverage. Um, and then next, kind of the next phase that we're showing is that this increased coverage, either through kind of expanding options of services that are covered or providing any coverage at all, seem to be translating into effects in terms of reductions in caregiver burden. Now, you know, this data source is great, but it is from 2009. That's quite a long time ago, and there's been a lot that's changed. So fast forward, let's think about, and this is something that we're hoping to pursue in kind of the next, next phases of this work, how have things changed now in 2021? Um, so first, there's only two states that have changed their automatic criteria since their automatic enrollment criteria since 2009. Um, states tend to kind of there's just a lot of stickiness in these policies. That's one reason why we've kind of used this cross-sectional difference and differences approach in, in the regressions I showed you today. Um, so in terms of the kind of immediate policy for SSI and automatic enrollment, there actually haven't been many changes since, since to the time of our data. But these, exp these express lane eligibility policies that kind of facilitate Medicaid enrollment through access to other programs like SNAP and TANF have expanded to, since this time. So it's possible that some of these programs may have reached some of these children through some of these other automatic enrollment policies mm -hmm. may have increased insurance coverage through these other means. Um, the same time, you know, even though perhaps some of, some more children have been reached, there's been increasing in insurance rates among children since 2016, particularly for children of cover. So that color, so there's still a need to kind of expand this coverage, and there's still a need to address these caregiving burdens. So. Um, you know, we're definitely hoping to pursue this. One thing we're doing now is we're trying to get access to claims data in these one of these states where we have seen a change in enrollment and kind of take a deeper dive into both the mechanisms and also kind of a more updated time period to see if this is still, you know, the extent to which this is still really having some bite in terms of expanding access for these families. Um, I'm just going to check the time quickly. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so that's kind of where we are here. I think I might just take a couple minutes and dive into the cash side if you all are. are yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay, go great. For it. Um, okay, so I think I can just, sorry, I organized these slides a little differently. Here we go. Um, so that's what, you know, that's kind of one component. This, this is a little bit more work in progress. And what we're trying to do on the cash side is take a different approach. Um, so the SSI cash benefit is fixed. It's a federal benefit. So it's pretty much, it's the same across all states. It's about $800 was the maximum benefit, $800 a month was the maximum benefit in 2021. Um, it is increased every year with the cost of living adjustment. And there are a number of states that offer a supplement for children um, kind of to increase that, that federal amount, but it's relatively small relative to the whole value of the benefit. But what we're trying to do with this, this next approach is take advantage of the fact that even though this is the same benefit across place, that prevents a lot of challenges in terms of using typical sources of, you know, kind of state variation. The real value of the benefit does vary across place. So, you know, you can think about $100 and how far that gets you in a place like New York City compared to, you know, a place in the rural south, for example. And there's a big difference in sort of the real value of that benefit for these families. Um, so what we're going to try to do is exploit this variation. And there's a variety of different ways you could try to measure this. We're going to try to take kind of think about this SSI benefit relative to other benefits that might be relevant to consider for the family. In this case, in particular, TANF. Um, 
So in most states, the same individual in a household cannot receive both SSI and TANF. There can be some different members in the same household to receive both benefits, but one individual cannot receive both benefits. Um, I mentioned before that there has been a significant amount of caseload shifting between these two programs historically, particularly around the time of welfare reform. Um, and that's driven by both a variety of in individual incentives as well as state incentives. So on the individual incentive side, it's driven just by the fact that the SSI benefit is simply much larger than the TANF benefit. Um, and on the state incentive side, it's driven by kind of the, this, this fiscal federalism um, um, trend here where the fact is that SSI is paid for by the federal government and a lot of the TANF, most TANF benefits are paid for by the states. And so states in sort of more negative fiscal situations have more of an incentive to try to encourage individuals to enroll in SSI. Um, so there's a robust literature from this, this period kind of immediately following welfare reform that shows that both of these, these mechanisms have an effect in terms of increasing in, you know, participation in SSI and shifting away from TANF. Um, so within a household, there's this leads to with variation within household in the benefit, and it depends on the size of the household. So the TANF benefit is a function of the household size. So when a child is enrolled in SSI, she's removed from that TANF benefit size for the household. Um, it's easiest to show this with a quick example. So take the example of Illinois in 2009, um, which is, you know, again, the time period from our data, the maximum benefit was about $674. Um, and then here I've listed what the maximum benefit was for TANF um, for different household sizes. So for example, first think about a household of four. If they were to enroll one of their children in TANF, then their maximum TANF benefit would fall to this household of three size. And so they would kind of lose that, that $40 difference between those two benefits. So they gain the maximum SSI benefit, but they lose that variation in between, lose that amount of benefit in between those two um, household sizes there. Similarly, you know, if you shift from household three to household for two, you see that there's an, a different change, but it, importantly, it's, it's not the same amount, right? It varies depending on where you were first in terms of household size and what happens when you reduce the household size by one. Um, so again, this varies not only between household sizes, but it also varies across states. And it varies non-linearly, so it's not the same, you know, difference between each kind of additional person in the household. So what we're going to do with this is we're using this as a way to measure sort of the relative value of SSI, not only across different states, but for different households within the same state relative to some other options that they might have, like this TANF benefit. Um, so this is, we're going to kind of compute this measure of sort of the maximum potential gain of SSI for a given household. Um, this is just showing, you know, I mentioned that this varies a lot across different household sizes and different states. And so this is just comparing the gain that you get from being in a, you know, a household of four shifting down to a household of three or being in a household of two shifting down to a household of one. What is sort of that relative gain of SSI for your household? And again, you can see there's there's just a lot of variety and a lot of variation here across states. Um, just to show it graphically, I think maybe hopefully you're getting the point, but this is showing geographically what the maximum benefit was for a family of three for TANF in 2009. Um, and then this is showing this measure of SSI gain that I just kind of explained how we're going to compute. And you can see, of course, in the areas where the TANF benefit is lowest, this results in the highest gain for SSI. And then finally, do we see this as just sort of a, a quick sanity check when we look at the participation rates of, of children in SSI? And you can see, again, you see these higher rates of participation, not perfectly, but there's some overlap in the states where we see that this net gain is also highest. So we're gonna try to use this in an instrumental variable strategy where we're gonna use this net gain kind of variable as an instrument that's going to predict SSI participation to, um, so again, here, the, one of the key things that's helping us with this strategy is the fact that we do have variation not only across states, but also within states due to variation in household size. Um, so this first equation here is our, our kind of first stage where we're going to use that variation to predict participation. And then the second stage is where we're going to look at all of these caregiving outcomes um, that I showed you before on the, on the Medicaid side. 
Our main assumptions, of course, with this IV approach are that the net gain is only affecting these caregiving outcomes through its effect on participation. Um, so in order to kind of support that assumption, it's a little bit harder to test or show like we were showing before for the, the difference in differences, but we're gonna include a lot of co controls for the state fixed effects. Um, household size is another really important one, as well as some of the other policies that vary within states. So another thing that varies in terms of household size is the value of childcare subsidies. So we're gonna control for some of these other policies um, and hopefully absorb a lot of those unobservable factors that are correlated with the net SSI gain. Um, so this is this is just showing our first stage. So is this this measure that we've constructed actually a relevant predictor for SSI participation? Um, so the dependent variable in all of these regressions is SSI participation. And you can see here, I've scaled these to be kind of representing a change of $100. So this is saying that essentially an increase in this net potential gain of $100 is associated with a three percentage point increase in um, SSI participation. Our preferred specification for this first stage is this, this center column here where we include all of our controls. So, you know, again, it, it's quite similar actually. There's not a lot of change when we include those additional controls for child health and these other policies in the state. Um, but again, th we're thinking about this as relative to a baseline mean of about 9% of the population in our sample who's participating in SSI. So this is sizable, it's on the order of about 30% or a little less than 30% change in the likelihood of participation. So that's what we want. If we wanna use this to predict participation, we want it to be a really strong and relevant predictor. Um, so next, then we look at this looking, we kind of run the IV where we're looking at the outcomes of interest. So this is just showing the, the OLS regression and then what we're seeing in the reduced form where we kind of just take, we're not, we take our um, IV and we regress it directly on the, on the outcome of interest. And then finally, the IV specification where we're taking the first two columns and um, adjusting that kind of reduced form um, by the first stage. And so what we're seeing here is that this is moving in the direction that you would expect, although our, our results are a little bit imprecise. And this is an area that we're hoping to continue working. So um, here, this is saying that this change of $100 is reducing the probability that the family receives or family has financial problems by about two percentage points although we're getting some imprecise estimates in the IV. Um, similarly, when you look at whether or not the family is kind of changing their work in order to care for their children, we're seeing that if this is reducing, you know, by a similar magnitude that need to change work, but again, imprecise estimates in the IV. So this is an area where we're still working, we're still pursuing um, ways to kind of refine this IV strategy in the future. But it's pointing in the direction that um, these, the cash benefit as well is also having an effect on these caregiving um, outcomes that we're interested in. Um, so yeah, now I will move back, sorry for the, to my conclusion slide and just say that, you know, this is definitely ongoing work, but we know that at this time that the SSI benefit package is, is more relevant than ever for families. And we're showing through these two mechanisms, both through the side of, expanding access to Medicaid, and also through the cash benefit, the, our work is pointing in the direction of suggesting that this program does mitigate caregiving burden, and that these gains are largest, particularly on Medicaid side for the lowest income families and families of color, suggesting that there could be effects on reducing disparities as well. So, you know, and thinking about what this means now, even though there's been a lot of challenges in accessing this program during the pandemic, it's extremely relevant and maybe one of the best mechanisms we have for reaching this population. So um, yeah, we should, we should definitely continue to find ways to make it easy for families to, to access this program. So um, next steps, I mentioned a little bit on the Medicaid side, we're gonna try to pursue some claims data. We're going to exploit a natural experiment in Ohio, which is one of those states that has changed their, their automatic enrollment policy. Um, and also the claims data will be allow, allow us to look a lot more carefully at what exactly is happening in terms of health service utilization um, to better understand these mechanisms for how this access is reducing caregiver burden. And on the cash side, we're you know, going to try to continue to refine this concept of the ID that we have. And finally, you know, we're also hoping to pursue some work related to the COVID and access to SSI issues that I've, I've mentioned. So, Thank yeah. So much. Thanks.
Uh, some questions for you. I'll start, but please, folks, uh, either in the chat or in the Q and A, please, please include uh, questions, and I will, uh, and I'll, and I'll sort of um, relay that. Uh, the um, one thing I was thinking about a lot as a caregiver is how differences across conditions are so profound, uh, and and, and um, I mean, when you're caring for somebody with an intellectual disability. On the one hand, you have more intense family caregiving responsibilities in some ways than some of the other things that you talked about. On the other hand, you also have some advantages, one being that there's very little social stigma and the other being that, especially if there's a genetic diagnosis involved, when something is very visible and obvious and viewed as severe, uh, a lot of the administrative burden issues and sort of rationing tend to be less mm -hmm. stringent. And I wonder if you've looked across conditions to see uh, 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 you know, to see if there's differences there. Yeah, um, it's a great question. We've done a little bit of that on the, on the Medicaid side. So we try to just use some, a kind of course cut of behavioral health, mental health conditions versus more physical health conditions and didn't see actually much difference um, when we did our cut that way. Although definitely it's a really good point. Um, I hadn't thought as much about this, this stigma issue or how that kind of something that's more visible or, or perhaps more severe reduces the administrative burden. Um, one thing that we've thought about as well is like, again, this is a population that at baseline has a lot of need for health services. So who are these people People who have still not even tried found a way to access these programs, even though that they have found a way to get on SSI. And so I think a little bit further consideration or careful look into the health conditions could help illuminate that question a little bit more too. Have um, you thought about including a qualitative component to this research? Yeah, I mean, I think it's another area that we we'd love to expand um, because it's it's there's only so much that you could see in the data. So I, I definitely think it would be really helpful both for kind of refining what we do on the, on the quantitative side, but also just providing a much richer picture of, of caregiving burden. It's one of the challenges on being a quantitative researcher and interested in these topics is that, yeah, a lot of it is just not measured well in data. So yeah, definitely something we're hoping to consider or pursue in the future too. Uh, questions from the, uh, questions from the, from the audience. Please, uh, um, um, Please feel free to uh, to chime in. Otherwise, I will. Uh, I'm obsessed with many of these topics, so as many of the people on here know, I would. I am quite capable of uh, uh, of of monopolizing your time. Um, um, if I here's a question for you for policy. Suppose that the Biden administration came to you and they said, you know, we're doing this infrastructure thing, but of course everything is infrastructure, so we can throw in. $50 billion for this population, however you want to spend it. Um, and uh, you just, you know, we have to have some plausible claim that's infrastructure, but don't worry about that. We've got, we've got plenty <laughs> okay, of- Yeah, uh, care, yeah, everything is infrastructure, right? Yeah, so how yeah, would you spend the money uh, in a way that you think would improve the lives of people that, that you're studying here? Yeah, um, that's Easy a really question. good question. So, yeah, I mean, so like the first thing that comes to my mind is maybe not a very expensive way to to um, to use the money, or maybe wouldn't take up very much of it. But it, I think we have enough evidence, both from this and you know from other work that's looked at automatic enrollment, that just kind of make it seem like a no-brainer. That why you know why are there still states that haven't um, expanded to automatic enrollment, even if you're only picking up a few families or kind of a small share of individuals? It just seems like a very straightforward way to to reduce one barrier to access and kind of expand access to care. So that's one thing I would definitely do. Um, you know, again, kind of in the same range of something that's probably not very expensive, but there's no reason in my mind that you can have a online application for SSDI, but there still are some, you know, it's not completely online for children. So that again, just seems like, I think the first order thing would be to eliminate a lot of these low hanging fruit, easy ways to kind of expand access to the program. Um, how much of that, by the way, is we don't want to expand access to the program? I mean, I mean it's, it's low hanging fruit if in fact you want to pick the fruit and eat it. If you do not want the fruit, then, uh, then, is, a, then is a bug that, that is, is convenient to access the program. And it does seem yeah. to be that there's an ambivalence about 
target efficiency where one where there uh, people don't vocalize this and certainly wouldn't vocalize this in a crown in a talk at the crown school but the idea that people kind of want it to be a little bit difficult so that mm -hmm. you get to the people who are truly needy yeah right yeah yeah, I know it's true. I mean, there's this issue, right? Of like, in a way, that's part of the design of these programs. That's why you have a really complicated application process, right? And you have to provide all this documentation. It's sort of a way of, yeah, of, of increasing targeting. Mm -hmm. um, I think some of our work, so like, for example, our work on the online application mm -hmm. showed that, you know, this is this, essentially, they introduced an online application in, in 2009 and what we see is you definitely have an increase in applications afterwards this is just for ssdi by the way but you have a commensurate increase in awards so and the kind of screening conditional on providing an application stay the same so this is not suggesting that you're really opening the floodgates to a lot of other people who maybe are on the on the fringes of like maybe i'd qualify maybe i'd not now it's easier for me to apply so i'll just see what happens but you're getting about the same kind of distribution of the population that you would be getting before. So um, I think in some situations, in, for some other programs potentially, that could be really maybe that kind of targeting or kind of the ordeal mechanism is important. I think less so for this population, um, or at least that's, that's what the evidence seems to be suggesting to date. So it doesn't mean that there's not still that kind of hesitancy perhaps, um, particularly in, in thinking about the cost side of things. Um, you know, on SSI, it's not even a short-term thing. The individuals tend to stay in these programs for a long time, so there could be long-term cost implications. But um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a challenging issue. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just thinking of other ways to spend the money, but if you had another question. No, go, go, ahead. go ahead. What are some other ways you spend the money? Yeah, so I mean, I do think that um, like home and community-based services, I think are another thing that, that can be really valuable for this population um, and often are quite limited and, and difficult to navigate. So just again, and a part of that could be because the service, you know, the available services are limited. And so again, expanding access or having more of that money available for those types of services could make it a little bit easier for families to get access to that sort of thing. Um, yeah. There, uh, there's a question. Tony uh, Sadler put in the chat, Tony, I should say her dissertation work is uh, very much on point to this. Uh, you use reduction of work to care for the child as a measure in your work. Uh, some policymakers may view this as a downside to the distribution of SSI benefits. How would you frame this finding to policy audiences? Yeah, thanks, that's a good question. So I will say that I struggle with that as an outcome a little bit because I, I think this is, perfect example of some a place where qualitative work could be really helpful because I don't know exactly how families are interpreting that question when they read it right like reduction in in work to care for my child it's not asking do you reduce your work overall or you know it's just it's a very kind of specific question um and there's other work showing so it's sort of like what does that mean if you're not reducing your work to care to, for your child does that mean you're working more or you're just not working but for other reasons um, and, you know, we do have some other work on SSI showing that actually kind of receipt of the program does reduce the number of hours that parents are working. So that might go against this sort of double negative of no, I'm not reducing my hours to work as much. Um, yeah, I, I, and, I, and to your broader question of, you know, is this kind of a something that policymakers not, might, might not like because it's suggesting that these families are working less. Um, I guess it, 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 it's it's a little bit tricky with the question as it's worded, but this might actually, if you believe the way this question is worded and it says we're not reducing our hours as much in order to care for their children, this could actually mean that it's kind of freeing them up to be able to work more um, because they can perhaps now afford to bring in other types of care or um, you know just have better care provided through something like Medicaid than they did before. But um, it's, it's a confusing question. So I think my answer may have been a little bit confusing, but the long and short is this would be something where we would really wanna dive in and, and talk to families more about it. One of the things that this, that, that question brings out is also there's, there's just an inherent trade-off. If you're attempting to focus public benefits on the population that is truly the most needy. Yeah. And so we, we have pretty stringent uh, restrictions on income and so on you will definitely reduce the number of people at the margin who get on the program who you might regard as in the gray zone, 
But once people are on, they will almost by definition have extremely poor incentives to work and to do things that would generate, you know, that are going to push them out of the eligibility range. Yeah. And one of the, uh, and in many ways, if we said, you know, you can get HCBS and for your kid in a way that's independent of your income, we would definitely have an explosion of people who would apply for some of these benefits potentially, but we would also see that people would not have to reduce their work hours and so on in order to stay eligible. Mm -hmm. and, and there is an inherent tension there. Uh, uh, and, and particularly, and I, think, and I think the public is ambivalent about how to resolve that tension, uh, depending on what the conditions are and the social stigma and all those, all those sorts of things. Um, one thing that also, I, since Tony and, and, and Dylan are on, uh, this is your, 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 your analysis is really about children. Mm -hmm. And what happens to these kids as they get older? And maybe some of them transition into SSI as young adults. Some yep. of them don't. Some of them stay at home and it's not exactly clear what happens. Right. Uh, have you looked at all in the at the difference between that sort of by, by age and what happens when people transition into adulthood? Yeah, so this is again something I think we'd like to be able to do once we are able to access the claims data, just again, because the, the data from Parisian now is a little bit limited, it's a cross section. So um, we, I, we did some cuts by age. We see the largest effects, I, I, yeah, maybe should have included that, but we see the largest effects in the adolescent age group. Mm -hmm. um, which is again, where we see a lot of the, the population focused. And also maybe if you think it may be in some ways a little bit harder to, to reach for some of these care needs. Mm -hmm. um, so, but yeah, the question about transition to adulthood is a good one. And that's where we would, would love to be able to kind of have claims data or, or a, another data source where you're able to view people over a longer period of time, particularly mm -hmm. around that transition. Um, and see what happens. I know definitely folks have looked at this. There's a redetermination at age 18 in SSI where you have to now qualify based on the adult criteria rather than the child criteria. So folks have kind of compared outcomes. Um, Manishi Deshpande, who's at um, the, in the econ department at Chicago, she yeah. has some more kind of looking at what happens to children who don't qualify at, through that redetermination compared to those who do. And that's some of the work um, that I said earlier that shows about that SSI is a really important stabilizer for income. So these other children are still earning, but kind of at very volatile levels after they leave. So we, you know, that, that suggests they're maybe working, but not kind of full time. But I think there's a lot more that we need to understand about what that transition means for, you know, other parts of their lives, whether they're, you know, staying at home, what that means for their families, um, their healthcare. Yeah, there's a lot that, there's a lot to dive, in, dive into there too. I would be really interested in also the, how these, how the families' trajectories differ, sort of across SES, because uh, you know I just I, there's just an entire industry of of social workers and uh, professionals to help middle class families navigate issues that children with special health care needs experience, and 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 that including that adult transition. Yep. And. And uh, ironically, that the folks that you're studying and you're who are SSI eligible are probably not getting these kinds of services. Right. And I wonder how many, like in Illinois, where we have the puns list. That uh, and again, I'm drawing on conversations that I've had with Tony about her dissertation. You know, just I just wonder how many people on SSI uh, are having conversations when their child is 12 about the puns list uh, right. compared to middle-class families who are not on SSI, but who know that someday their loved one will be on SSI mm -hmm. uh, and, and ways that, that that complexity creates disparity. Yeah. Um, Tony may want to pipe in because she knows more. Yeah, no, I would love to, love to hear more about her thoughts on the transition. Yeah. Um, there are um, um, other questions from the, uh, from the peanut gallery. Um, what is it that's most surprising in this when you present these data to policymakers? Or do they kind of shrug their shoulders and say, you know, are they jaded to it or? Uh, yeah. Well, kind of so we haven't done too much yet sharing with policymakers on the, on this particular data. Um, I personally was surprised 
to find anything on the automatic enrollment side because my thought was just like and then and the kind of conventional wisdom is for a lot of these kids like oh they're all eligible anyways right they're likely eligible on the basis of income and mm -hmm. like i said they have high a need for health care so you would imagine that they would have found a way to could be connected to the program already so that to me was the most surprising thing and just the fact that it's so consistent in terms of the the lowest income individuals who are the ones with where we see the largest effects, even though they're like by far and away the most likely to be eligible for these programs at baseline. Um, so that to me, I think, you know, just really, again, highlights the need for other, it's not just about granting eligibility or it's a lot of these other kind of intermediate services to direct people and kind of connect them with the right services and right care seem to be really important. Um, yeah, so also, I mean, the, the cash side is still, is still ongoing, but, um, I think a lot of people thought that this relationship and sort of the relative value of SSI and thinking about shift loading, shifting from other types mm -hmm. of benefit programs was kind of an artifact of this period of welfare reform, but we're still seeing that it's kind of a strong predictor, um, you know, post welfare reform. So that, that was my, you know, kind of surprise on that side as well too. And we're, you know, not sure if it's going to be able to kind of serve us well in terms of looking at the caregiving outcomes. We're hoping to kind of look at some other data sources or, or maybe expand our sample a little bit more to get a little more strength in that instrument. But those are two things that I, you know, when we're ready to take it to policymakers would want to really drive home to those, those groups. And one of the, one of the things so many of these, uh, by the way, it's such a Moynihan and Heard type story with administrative burden and how um, you know your nominal your your financial eligibility just doesn't really describe the barriers to right. uh, to getting onto a program of this nature uh, and uh, and I do think like the comparison between the ADHD group and the IDD group would be interesting because yep. particularly if you picked a group like pe you know people or people who use wheelchairs people uh, living with a with a diagnosed genetic disorder versus versus something like ADHD, I think you would find that they're just their interactions with the systems are just very different. Very different. Yeah. And uh, and I wonder if I wonder if school administrators would also be a useful group to have in in the in uh, you know in that in that study because of course they're they're on the front lines of all of that. Right. Yeah I was I was just going to mention that too and you know Tony or other folks who kind of think thought about this transition age. I think the schools are a really important facilitator in a lot of ways. It's another area we'd like to do more work is think about special education and SSI and how these programs interact. Um, because it could be that children are identified in a school setting or it's easier to kind of pick up on some of these, um, you know, things like ADHD in a, in a school setting. And then that is an, another way that sort of allows families to learn more about SSI or, or facilitates their ability to get access to these programs. Um, so yeah, that's a lot of these are identified, you know, around school age time or later when the, when the families themselves maybe haven't totally picked up on it, but other, other people in the school setting too. Now, is there any difference? The other thing that also made me curious was wondering if how Medicaid expansion, the ACA Medicaid expansion might complicate this story. Yeah. Because you do have, uh, in the fact that it's so regional that the states that um, the states that have by far the lowest TANF benefits are also the states that didn't expand Medicaid by and large. Right. How does ACA Medicaid expansion put, uh, fit into this story? Yeah. So I, I think on our, on, a, on the Medicaid side, you know, a lot, even at the time that we're looking in our data before ACA expansion, the income eligibility limits for children were you know, much higher in nearly all the states. There hasn't really been much change or as much change on the child side. So of course there's other ways that families could have gotten access through exchanges or things like that. Um, so there could still be expansions in insurance even post, you know, ex ACA for these children that kind of maybe would lead us to finding larger effects in the pre-ACA period than you might find in the post-ACA period. Um, on the, the kind of TANF cash side, that's an interesting question. I haven't thought as much about the way that that interaction would work. Um, I guess, you know, I mean, one thing we're kind of using this as a, we're using the TANF as sort of a proxy or a measure for the relative value, but at the end of the day, there's, it's, 
as you could see in some of the summary statistics, it's such a small share of the population that's participating in TANF that, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think one, it may, as I mentioned before, sort of Medicaid expansions have sometimes served the need that these families are looking for, and it sort of reduces inflow into SSI. So there's been some work looking at that interaction post ACA and mm -hmm. I think that it's kind of a conflicting story. Like some people find that there's increases because the Medicaid allows you to have that documentation or sort of identify some of the conditions that might facilitate access onto SSI, but others are finding the reverse likely due to the fact that now they're able to get Medicaid. So they have less of a need for SSI. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah, you're right that TANF is such a small program and the benefits are so low in some of the states. I mean, the maximum benefit for a family of three in some states is below $200 a month. Right. So yeah. that's that's a quarter of the uh, SSI benefit, roughly. Exactly, yeah. So it's, it's, it, it's, it's gonna be tiny. Yeah. Um, there, um, and then last last question, I think, as we sort of get near the, near the time. What is, for you, what was the most surprising thing that you found in this work? That, that sort of turned your turned your priors or, or was contrary yeah. to what you expected to find. Yeah. So, you know, as I mentioned before, the, I guess Andy and I kind of started talking about this automatic enrollment thing a while ago. And he was like, let's just, let's just see if there's something there. And I was like, really, you think so? So I was that, that I think to me is the most surprising thing. And that's what's pursued our interest in kind of seeing what's going on now or seeing, you know, how this is continuing to have an effect. Um, and then I think, so one, to find those effects in terms of changes in insurance enrollment was, was interesting, but to see that, you know, it looks like for these same groups, we're seeing some changes on the, on the caregiving side as well. Um, again, it was just surprising. It was illuminating to me about how these small changes and kind of just default or kind of access issues can have real, real impacts in terms of not only in coverage, but also outcomes for these families. There, um, let's see, there's something else in the chat. Uh, uh, Dylan says that the, uh, this was a great presentation. In thinking about the intersection between TANF and SSI, have you looked at or thought about the difference of losing TANF in total if a parent has one child versus multiple children and therefore yeah. SSI enrollment translates to just a reduction in TANF? Sorry if my question isn't exactly clear. No, I thank no, I it's very clear and I thank you because I know that that could be tricky to explain to that, but your question confirms that like you're tracking with what I was <laughs> explaining. So um thanks. And I so I guess I hadn't thought about it being there being much of a difference at all, other than the fact that sort of the relative gain of SSI in in that situation is is going to be, let me make sure I get this right. So if you're losing the whole TANF benefit to enroll in SSI, that means it's it's like a kind of a smaller relative gain, I guess, than what you see, because you're giving up more. Um, so in the same way that these things are not always a, the same change when you're going from a household of four to three, like that can be a smaller change sometimes from going to three to two or vice versa. It mm -hmm. seems like that would only be magnified if, if there was a single child, you know, like a child only case that was kind of rolling off of TANF altogether. There, um, by what have you, speaking of the child only cases, um, there are, um, what about family, just an immigration question that I haven't thought about until this moment when you mentioned child only case, but yeah. the not trivial fraction of the child only cases involve a case where a child is a US citizen and the parent caregiver is not. Yeah. Uh, uh, how does that, how do situations like that play out in SSI? So, you know, the beneficiary has to be permanent resident um, or, you know, I mean, you permanent resident, or I guess there's some exceptions for like refugees and other other types mm -hmm. of immigration statuses. Um, or if the child is a citizen, you know, all of those situations mean the child would be eligible. But one thing we did see that, you know, just in kind of some descriptive regressions where we're regressing SSI participation on a variety of characteristics, one of the most strong kind of negative predictors of SSI status is, um, you know, native English speaking status. So that's something we don't really have the sample size to dig in too much, unfortunately, in our data, but it seems mm -hmm. like that that's a that's a really important kind of maybe facilitator of knowledge about the program. Or again, this is 
harder than a lot of programs to get access to because you need all of this documentation. And so it could be that there's challenges either in the knowledge or in the in kind of completing the application that are that are really even bigger for immigrant families or kind of mixed status families. I wonder about the public charge rule and how that yeah how that might affect families' willingness to yeah. keep in place with the system. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, well, thank you so much. I think we've reached the uh, the witching hour, okay. uh, but really learned a ton, and this is such important work. And uh, I, I am waiting uh, anxiously to see what your next phase will bring. And uh, and I'm sure that if you want to go the qualitative research route, that a uh, number of folks here would uh, would have some serious game sure. to to get involved with that. Yeah, no, that would be great. I'd be happy to chat. So thanks so much. Thanks really much for inviting me and having me today. I really appreciate it. And I'm happy to chat offline uh, further about this or anything related. So. Thank you everyone for, for joining us. Great. Thank you.